Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sportages cast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you're tuning in from to hear sports stories from the experts. Our guest today is a professional squash coach and former pro player. He reached the world ranking of number 14 when he was playing. Uh, he spent the last two decades training some of the world's best players, including world number seven, Amanda Subhi, and her sister, world number 20, Sabrina Subhi. Over the last year, uh, last 10 years or so, he has headed up the squash program at the Tennis and Racket Club in downtown Boston. He has also traveled the world as a visiting squash coach for the Pakistan Squash Federation and the Squash Rackets Association of Malaysia. Welcome to the show, Shahid Zaman Khan. How are you? Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. And thanks for the introduction. Um, really appreciate that. Shahid, let's get right into it. Um, you know, squash, it's been a bit of a tough period with COVID, uh, indoor sport, a lot of difficulties around that front. But just in... Uh, whatever may be going on in your world, I wanted to hear a little bit about what you've been up to at the tennis and racket club, uh, what's been going on, how's COVID sort of impacted all of that, and just a bit of a background on what you've been up to. So thank you, Zushan. Um, uh, I was with tennis and racket club since past uh, 10 years, but now I switched my job to a Boston, very prestigious club and uh, in heart of Boston, in Boston downtown, the club called uh, Equinox Sports Club yep. Boston. So I'm working over there since past uh, last month. But yes, it was a uh, it was a beautiful ten years with Tennis and Rider Club, and I trained so many great squash players over there, even, um, including Amanda, Sabrina, and so many others. You know, even. Uh, some of the Pakistani squash players, Farhan Zaman, and so many others. Whoever comes and wants my help, um, I never say no. I mean, I always uh, welcome everyone to come and train with me. And it was very nice uh, 10 years um, at Tennis and Riot Club, but now I think this is the next chapter, so I just move on to a ne next club. So you're talking about the COVID. COVID is, you know, I think slowing down a little bit in USA because people are um, having vaccines. I already have vaccine too. So whoever had vaccine, you know, they're not wearing masks here, but who don't have, I think they are still um, uh, wearing masks. And I think that's what president of United States keep asking that, you know, we have to have the vaccine. So, so we can go do our work. So how has it been, I guess, before the vaccines were sort of rolled out uh, was a lot of the squash uh, shut down? Uh, did you know? Was there much activity on that front? Obviously, now that things are progressing quite significantly, uh, so the game's back on. But what had it been like over the past, you know, year and a half or so before the vaccines came through? How did that impact the game over there specifically? So, Zushan, it was very hard for professional squash players, as you know that squash is a game is one-to-one -one. you have to be with the person one-to-one -one, and it's a very heavy breathing game so you know it's like there is more chances that you can give COVID to someone else if you have symptoms or something you know and from past one and a half year all the clubs were closed all the gym was closed so you know all these athletes were struggling but um, I know you went professional squash too but really thankful to Egypt Egyptian squash and now it's coming to United States again I mean, it's coming back. Everything is coming back soon. But um, it was very hard, a one and a half year. But what happens in this one and a half year, what I realize, and I ask parents that, you know, so many parents, because, you know, I mean, squash played by elite here. I mean, you know, because of colleges, because of school, squash played with elite uh, people. So they have the funds to do anything, you know. So what, what they did, you know, so many parents, I know that, you know, they are building squash courts in their home. It's not for everyone, but, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's growing. Squash is growing, but, you know, I mean, if you have the funds, you know, it's not very expensive to build squash court. So that's what's going on right now here. That's very interesting uh, because, you know, I was talking to a wonderful 
guy in El Salvador, uh, Carlos Schonenberg, and he's uh, built four open air courts for less than 28,000 US dollars. So, uh, you know, you think of that. And then when we see squash courts, at least here in Australia, they cost a lot of money. I, I'm assuming it's a bit cheaper in America as, you know, real estate is cheaper there than here. But uh, it's, 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 it's interesting that, you know, you sort of bring that up. And I guess that sort of takes me to my next question. When we look at, for example, squash here in Australia, you know, they, we had greats like Jeff Hunt, Rodney Martin, Heather McKay, that sort of thing. Today, squash is very much on a decline. People often don't know what the game even is. I mean, I think there, I think that in Australia, the awareness is still there. Similarly, in Pakistan, uh, the other day, I was, uh, I was in a cab with a Pakistani driver and I was talking to him about, about the game. And he says, did you know that uh, we had like the best squash player ever? His name was Jahangir Khan. And, and I said, you didn't know that? <laughs> so he only <laughs> just found that out a couple of months ago. So, you know, that sort of shows us, at least from my perspective of where the game has gone. In your opinion, what's gone wrong on that front? with the game what's that what are those missing elements that have sort of reduced that in countries like pakistan and australia that have had very strong squash histories so Zushan, the simple answer for your question is that you know if you are if you ask me that question i know and i see every single thing too because after john share me and my cousin mansoor zaman was in top 16 in the world yeah. and i was top 14th and I was beating all these players. I beat Paul Price in Qatar. He was world number four. He won the British Open. I beat again David Evans who won the British Open and I beat him. I mean, if you beating all these top 10 players, it just means that there you have chances to go into the top level. But the problem was we were facing on that time, especially Pakistan. Uh, Australia, I know a little bit of Australia too because if you don't have the past world champions working in your own country with sincerity, if they move on because of good opportunity to outside, it's going to be very hard for younger generation to catch and to develop themselves. Because, you know, if you don't play into the top level, you can't explain someone that how it's looked like to be a top 10 squash player, how, how it feels, what you have to work. And, you know, it's one-to-one -one game. It's not a team sport. It's one-to-one -one game. If you see the past players, you know, every coach make a player. Like if you see, if you talk to Ramat Khan, he give his life. Like I was talking to my uncle Yasin. I was living with him in London for five years where John Sheer was in his house for five years. I was in the same house with him for five years when I was training, when I was um, in top 16. So I asked him that, you know, he says, Shahid, Jah uh, Ramad give Jahangir his whole life. So, you know, it's not easy to make world champion. It's, it's basically a coach who's playing in player. It's the coaches, you know, it's the coaches who produce great squash players. So the Pakistan, what, what Pakistan was having problem, Pakistan was having that problem, but Pakistan was having the big problem was the crisis because of, um, you know, that what was the situation after, 9-11, you know, the um, Americans went to Afghanistan and then, you know, all the sports department was shut down. The Pakistan International Airlines was shut down and all the sports was gone. It was not damaged squash. And, you know, because the biggest advantage was Pakistani squash players. They were working very hard. It's not that, you know, they was not working hard. We were not, we were working very hard, but there was no opportunity. There was no financial help. And if there is no financial help, if you're not giving someone, uh, because the one thing Pakistan International Airline was giving, there was tickets. If you give someone a ticket to go to Australia, to go to England, to go to USA, it's easy for them to go and perform. And, you know, when you come outside, you know, you always ask help from other people and people always help you to give accommodation and some other stuff. But when you don't have that ticket uh, financial help, it's not easy to to buy those tickets, you know, especially squash is played by humble background families, you know. I mean, those families have sometimes 
F3, 3, 4, 4 children in home, if they are giving only support to one child, then other three were, you know, it's, it, it was, that was, that, that was the biggest problem Pakistan was facing on that time. Sure, sure, sure. Very, uh, very interesting. And if we look at, um, I guess, the opposite situation where you touched on an interesting point about how coaches would come back because the situation would be good uh, and that would enable them to then train up the youth. I think Egypt, do you think Egypt has done that really well? Because a lot of the coaches, a lot of the former top players have stayed back and then trained up a lot of the uh, best players that we see today and over the last three, four, five, six years. Zushan, uh, if there is no opportunities financially, if the coaches was not paid good amount in their own countries, then, you know, they, of course, you know, looking for better opportunities, which other countries can provide. Yeah. Like so many great squash players move to Arab countries yeah. like Doha, Kuwait and so many other countries. Why? Because, you know, there were, those people were paying so much high uh, monthly payments, you know, and, yeah. and, and in Pakistan, you know, if and you if you have skills, but you're not getting a good job, if you don't have a good job, don't have life security, then you're looking for something good you know and that's the main main important thing pakistan was facing is that all the talent was gone out mm -hmm. like if you see today's squash hamza was with me here um you know hamza won the british open my nephew my sister son so he was here for one month and when i see him i was i i was seeing I, i'm i'm not saying i'm the best coach in the world but it's 11 years who teach me squash you know because basically uh, what happens, Zushan, that when you are a professional squash player, it's different when you're becoming squash coach, it's totally different. Because so many great professional squash players can teach you squash. It has to be, you have to love the game. You have to spend a lot of time in coaching field. And you have to be able to create that or, or learn from others too. Like you, you sometimes, you know, when you're giving lessons, when you're giving lessons, you learn from the children, you learn from the parents, you learn from school. It's consistently, you know, you have to learn. Mm -hmm. You have to learn new game. I mean, the game is totally changed now. The game which you played in the back days and game you, is it's too fast. You have to have its, its point rally, it's 11 scoring. You have to have the quickness. Yeah. You have to have that zigzag fast movement in the court. You have to have that wrist. And, you know, it's like it's very fast. But the biggest issue um, what Pakistan is facing, Pakistan is facing the biggest issue. There is no top coaches. Hamza was here. So I see Hamza's game. So I played with him. I can still go in the court and I can still play. So, you know, I say, Hamza, the biggest problem you are facing, you don't have the pace. You don't have the pace. If you don't have the pace, it's not his mistake. Mm -hmm. It's not his mistake that he don't have a pace. If he's playing with the people who's lower level than him, then he don't know what it's look like. Because yeah. right now, he's playing with the people who he's beating and his father is happy, his mother is happy, everyone is happy. And he thinks, you know, he's a lion in the jungle. It's not going to work like this. You have to go in a different situation where you can see better players and then you can progress over there. So even, you know, I played a little bit squash in top 20. So when I played with him, you know, he says, you're hitting the ball so tight. Right now I'm totally out of shape, you know, because I was not playing with any good players here. But for him, you know, I was a little bit hard because I was hitting the ball tight. I see, you know, when you play top 10 squash players, they're not going to give you the shots easy. The ball is coming so tight. So you have to work for that and you don't have patience. Mm -hmm. You like to go for one after other shots. It's not going to work in professional squash. In professional squash, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. You have to rally. You have to wait for weak return. And emotionally, you have to fix yourself because your emotions are too high. If the point goes against you, you think, you know, it's end of the world and you're trying to hit the neck or drop again. Yeah. That's that's now it's not going to work like this. So Hamza. So those things, you know, in one month, I mean, he was here and I was like observing what is his mistakes. So in those in those, um, uh, you know, days, I was like working with him and I was explaining him that, you know, what you have to work on. And, uh, you know, that's what 
only professional squash players, only the people who played in top level can see those things. If the coaches never played in top squash, they can't observe that. Sometimes the local people can make a great squash player. There's no question about it. My father was a local squash player, but he produced great squash player. But still, when you go in top 10, it's a totally different story. Yeah. It's a totally different story. It's analyzing. And, you know, it's everything is available on the YouTube, everything available on the videos. You know, the coaches are keep working, keep watching. And you see that if you see, um, uh, uh, what, was his, uh, what was his name from uh, New Zealand? Paul Cole. Paul Cole, yeah. Paul Cole still changing his techniques, you know, like wrist up, ragged up, cock wrist, still working on um, so many things, you know, so he don't block himself in the back. He can, you know, working on his stepping. So these things, you know, coaches can still working. I mean, you know, they have to see their players, but it's all comes with interest. Mm -hmm. If you have an interest to make someone um, a great squash player, it takes time. It takes time. Definitely, definitely. And it's very, uh, it's it's really fascinating to obviously hear your insights on the Pakistan front. But of course, you're in the US, you've been there for a significant period of time, worked with uh, the highest ranked uh, US squash player ever, uh, Amanda Sobhi. So tell me a little bit about the game there, because from what I understand, you know, people still know what racquetball is. Uh, yeah. My, my father, who played squash, as I was telling you before we started talking, um, when he was studying in the U.S. in the 80s, he actually told me that he played with his university's top uh, racquetball player. They played squash, and he beat him, and they played racquetball, and my dad beat him as well. So, yeah. so you know, it was he, that's how he always defined the difference to me between the games. But... You also touched on this earlier. Squash is an elite sport there. Uh, yeah. It's often, you know, a means or, a, or an avenue or a pathway for children, for parents to get their children into good universities. And of course, that's very important. Um, yeah. But there are also cases where there are urban programs of squash taking place. Uh, so how is the game sort of looking there? There's a new uh, squash center that's come up recently. What's what's going on? What's the youth like that you're working with? Are people, do people recognize the game? I just want you to touch on a little bit of how you said, you know, it, it is growing. There's no doubt about it. So, Zushan, um, I was very lucky that I was in a very good squash club, um, which has rackets racket, which I never see before. That's totally different game than squash, yeah. which has um, court tennis, the the court tennis racket is totally different yeah. ball. It's called Royal Tennis. I, I hope you, yeah. uh, there's, there's, there's a court in uh, Australia too. So, um, and then there is a game called hardball, which I never see in Pakistan. So hardball, yeah. racket, racket, court tennis, and then squash, softball. Softball was not famous. I think softball gets famous when, uh, um, I think like 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, I think, or you can say 20 years ago, then, you know, it's becoming more and more popular here in the United States. And the biggest thing is taking off. It's because it can give you a uh, good, good opportunity to go to college or good opportunity to go to school. That's why people putting a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, money involved in that sport because you know if you go to college here it's not easy it's if you go to any ivy league college yep. it costs you like sixty thousand dollars or seventy thousand dollars and where squash you know like if you see ali farag yeah. and all these talented kids even me you know um i will tell you a little bit about me that i played um, the world junior championship in 1998 me and mansoor yeah which happened which um held by princeton new jersey in princeton university yeah. and jahangir was our manager for 21 days we were in the dorm of princeton university so mr bob cullen who was the coach may god bless him he uh, he passed away so so you know mr bob says to jahangir that you know i want these two kids and i want to help him free scholarship i'm not going to charge him anything free financial aid i'm going to help him to study here and Jahangir came in my room because he was our manager and Maksud Ahmed was the coach. Yeah. 
So uh, Jahangir says that Shahid people selling their properties and come here for um, having education, stop here and study here. I said, Jahangir, you know, I want to become world champion like you because I, when I see your respect, when I see people come and see you from all around the world, I want to be world champion like you. And I see world champion in my family, my home, you know, Kamar Zaman was world champion. So I see that, that, you know, because when I was growing up, Zushan, I was seeing Pakistan. Hockey was world champion. Yeah. Cricket was world champion. Squash was world champion. Billiard was world. So I see that, that time, you know, so I don't, I, I just want to play squash on that time. So, and then, you know, I regret, uh, I'm not regretting. I mean, I, I say to them, I say, I can't, I can't study here. I want to go back to Pakistan. But, you know, and then in 2000, I was playing the World Juniors Championship and I played with uh, Kareem Darwish in the semifinal. And the Harvard coach was there, Baj, Zander Bajwa. He says, I'll help you, son. I'll help you come study in Harvard. I say, Harvard, America is too far. I'm not going to go to USA and study over there. You know, I just want to go to Pakistan and train and play squash. And, you know, I don't know that that was in my luck that I was training Harvard number ones here in Boston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was in luck. Yeah. That was in luck. So there are two opportunities I get because of my good squash. That's why people are putting so much efforts in squash because squash can take you to the college, a very good college. Sometimes, sometimes it's not just money can take you to great colleges yeah. because you need to have that uh, some kind of sports skill which will be helpful for you to go to college. And you talk about the uh, um, squash busters, means like, um, you know, uh, urban programs. Yeah. So I was working with squash busters because right. basically, you know, I work here. So I was thinking, you know, it's good to give my knowledge to uh, people like we come from humble background too, you know. So we always thinking, you know, if we give them little knowledge, you know, it goes around, comes around. You do good deed, you know. Yeah. Somebody can do good deeds with you. I mean, it's it's that's how it works. So yes, you know, squash is growing big time here in the United States. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and it, in between all of that, you did talk a little bit about your own family, and I wanted to. Uh, get a little bit more from you there. Of course, everyone knows about your uncle, uh, Kamar Zaman, absolute legend, globally known for the, uh, the sport. I was actually talking to Jeff Hunt not too long ago, and he, yeah. he sort of said to me that uh, some of the toughest games that I've ever played were with him. So, uh, you know, very, very renowned. I think anyone who knows squash in Pakistan as well knows him and globally anyone who knows the squash knows him. But tell us a little bit more about the wider extended family because I know that squash is essentially in your blood. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to hear a lot about that because, you know, being a Pakistani myself, I've heard the stories and I know yeah. from my friends and family. But if I look online, there's not a lot of information. So I'd love to hear it from you. Tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, that background and how you got into the game and everything. Yeah, so when I was born in Quetta, um, my mother has always talked about the brother. I mean, you know, my mother says, you know, my brother is a world champion. This that I mean, you know, he was very famous. He was very famous and he was very generous. He was a very good person too. I mean, he was a great squash player. He was a magician of squash, and, but he was very humble and looking after the family. I mean, the, that person built his whole family, yeah. changed the story. Now, if if anybody plays in the family, I think the credit, I will give the credit to him. And my father, I was asking my dad, you know, I was asking my father uh, who produced so many. I mean, I can tell you about a little bit about my father, yeah. what he did to players, how. And you talk about Pakistan squash decline. So this is very important. This story, I think people want to hear this because uh, when I when I grew up, you know, in 1992, I was 10 years old um, or, or eight years old. So we have the sports name called Gul Sports. Yep. So that sports shop has every kind of sport, sports uh, uh, goods, you know. But the main important thing was the squash racket, strings, grips, and those other things, you know. And in Quetta, in Quetta, we were playing in Quetta Club and in Staff College Quetta. So my father was a squash coach in Quetta Club and Staff College Quetta. Even 
for General Parvez Musharraf. He was also my father's student. <laughs> so I was, I was, I, I, I listened that from my mother so many times. She was saying to my dad, you know, you were giving all these, because there was a one register was 1992, there was one register was over there and everybody was like taking things and putting their names because they don't have money on that time, you know. And Kamar Zaman was very generous. He was giving so many rackets because he was sponsored by Ascot, Dunlop, and so many other big brands. So he was giving so many rackets to my father. So my father bring those rackets to Koita and putting in the shop so he can sell sometimes. But, you know, there was 150 people who were playing in three squash courts in Koita Club. And everybody was like breaking strings, grips, and coming to golf sports, like my father's sport. And I was, I was like seeing that as a child, you know, seeing that big register full of names, but no one is charged, you know, like for, and my mother was saying that you are giving everything free to people. How are we going to be surviving? You know, <laughs> He's, he says to my mother all the time and he was, he was doing coaching to other kids, you know, and I was like crying sometimes. I say, you know, dad is not playing with me and playing with other people, you know, please tell him. So she was fighting with dad that, come on, you know, play with your son. So he says, you know, don't worry. Your son's going to do well, better than them. You know, it's like someone else's children. This is my children. He was just giving his love to people. And he was telling my mother that, you know, these kids who play squash, they can't afford anything. If I ask them to bring the money, they're not going to play squash mm -hmm. because they don't have the money to, to, you know, restring their racket sometime, you know, buy a squash ball or grip. It's it's too expensive for them. Yeah. So he knows that, you know, because he has that, you know, inside his heart was so big. So he was always delivering. Yeah. So that's the main important thing that because of people, Zushan, because of people, you know, you made champions, you make them, you love them and grow them. That's how, you know, you built uh, those squash players. So my mother was talking about Kamar Zaman and Kamar Zaman, uh, um, you know the story. If you talk to him, he's a legend yeah. and the way he will explain his story. But I know this, that, you know, uh, they were very poor. There were 11 brother sisters, 11. So my mother says, you know, uh, we were that poor that sometimes we don't have the food to eat. But Kamar was crazy. And he was just like hitting the ball hours and hours on the court with the broken balls. With like yeah. when when members when members were playing in the squash court, the the squash balls like broken squash balls. Yeah. So he was taking all the squash balls and taking home. And his mom was you know patching those balls with sui daga, yeah. like you know the balls. So he says you know I was going in the front of the court, and I was just hitting that you know like like little bit drop shot from different angles which Rami was doing yeah. so basically people didn't see him and somebody you know I think one of the guys from squash stories Jamie Maddox is posting because he saw him and I was talking to my father I say everybody talks about Kamar because I don't know because I was a child mm -hmm. on that it says you don't know him you didn't see him he was magician of squash ahead he was his wrist was it was just God gifted thing you know but it was when you ask him, he says it was all hard work. Yeah. So he says, you know, I was hitting the ball hours and hours, like four or five, four, four, five hours sometimes. And my sister comes on the squash court. Come, come home. Mom, mom is like calling you. Come. He says, go, 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 go. I'm doing some, some special work, you know. I'm like, and he says that I was running in the snow because Koita is very cold. So, you know, there was a lot of snow in Koita. So he says I was running in the snow and people were calling my father, you know, your son is going out of order you know something is wrong with him <laughs> but you know all those things you know when the time comes to play in the tournaments people call him like you know magician of squash mm -hmm. we believe we believe and we have a faith because we you know faith is very important values are very important mm -hmm. so we believe that you know because my mother says that you know my father was very religious and he was praying all the time for him that, you know, may God bless him and, you know, make him, make him world champion. So that little talent and I think prayers, a yeah. lot of prayers, a lot of prayers make him a superstar, you know, in the world. And that one person, you know, fix whole things, you know. And I think that sometimes you can say that's, you know, um, dream comes true. Yeah. That was a dream. Yeah. Wow. That's a very, very sort of heartfelt and 
it, you can, yeah. I could just, you know, tell the passion and emotion there, just incredible. And absolutely, like, I mean, my father has seen him play uh, live as well and has so many great things to say. I wasn't even born, so <laughs> not much that I can add. But uh, yeah, from what I hear, and, you know, you just added to that as well. Uh, Shahid, before we sort of conclude and wrap things up, uh, just wanted to... Uh, tell everybody watching and listening to be sure to follow uh, Shahid Zaman Khan on Instagram, all his other socials. They will be in the description or caption below. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Shahid, before we finish, um, just tell me a little bit about, you know, now you're working at a new club. Uh, what's going on with you for the future? What are you working on? What are your next sort of set of goals and targets before we wrap things up? So, um, Zushan, I was lucky that I work with Tennis and Rider Club. That's a private club. That's a very private club. And I have to say that in your, um, you know, because you talk to me, I think it's good that I have to appreciate and thankful to be, uh, to say thanks to them because I, I spent my life 10 years with them, especially Mr. Tom Dobbins, who was just, I think, retiring very soon. And the honor of the club, Mr. Devin Hamlin's. I mean, who was, who treat me like I was, when I came after professional squash, I was weak speaking English and there are so many things that are weak, but they were treating me because of talent. You know, I have the talent, I have the skills because I played a little squash. So I was a hardworking person. So I was working hard with sincerity and they seize that. And, you know, they really give regards till now, till today, they really miss me and they, um, I mean, you know, I don't have the words to say thanks to them. But now this is a new chapter, new club. It's been one month I'm working over there. And uh, what I hear, because you always hear, you know, it's word of mouth. You know, you always hear from other people. You don't want to say that you are the best thing. You know, you want to listen from other people's, you know, mouth or, you know, it's like this is, you know, shy. You were the best coach. So I'm thankful, you know, for that. But, you know, my main internal, what I want, you know, what I want from inside that I always wanted that, that, you know, somebody can come up from my hands. Before I was not a squash coach. Now I'm growing. Now the hair is getting gray a little bit. So I get a little bit more knowledge. So now I understand yeah. what is squash. I mean, you know, when you finish squash, as a professional squash player, you don't understand squash. You know that how to hit length, cross. Even sometimes you don't have any knowledge when you're playing squash. But when you jumping into the coaching side, then you will understand that what is real squash looks like. You know, what you have to, how you to develop, how to develop yourself. That is what uh, Pakistani players are lacking, which, I mean, if you come this, this side of the world, um, West, you know, I mean, they explain everything in our in our coaching style you know you just hit the ball hit the ball but you don't have why i'm hitting the ball where the ball need to land where yeah. it has to die when what is the strategy when i play what is my plan there is no plan but just like go and hit the ball that's what we are lacking so these things you know we have to fix and i'm really thankful and i hope you know people will listen and uh, for younger generation my advice is there is no shortcut, no question about it. There is no shortcut. There is consistent persistence. I mean, you have to work hard. Yeah. There is no shortcut. If Jahangir says that, you know, he's the biggest world champion in the world, he, when he says to me one day, he says, when I was world champion, world number one, I was hitting one hour length on the forehand, one hour on the backhand. So, you know, it, sh it shows that, you know, your hours, your time, required for this game if you have the desire to go to the top level and uh thank you very much for your time zushan no the the uh it's it was just absolutely fantastic having you on shahid uh once again for everyone watching listening wherever you are be sure to follow uh shahid on social media the links will be in the description caption below shahid absolute pleasure having you on thanks so much for taking out the time coming on very late i know that it's uh, late there in America, we're in completely different parts of the world and different. It's we're in another day at the moment. So, <laughs> but look, wish you all the best, and uh, you know, looking forward to seeing and hearing about all your successes, mate. Thank you, Zushan. Thank you, and you're most welcome. Whenever you're in Boston, you are my guest. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.